Now we're going to move to uh, Plato's, uh, I'm sorry, Nietzsche's uh, epistemology. And so we're going to look at what he thinks is the proper way to gain knowledge of the world. So how do we know what we believe to be true? This is a big question for anyone, any, any worldview. You have to base your beliefs on some kind of evidence or on some kind of uh, justification, right? So in the modern era, beginning about 1630, when we talked about the beginning of modernity, there were two camps that emerged, two different views on how you got justification for your beliefs. Now, the classic formula or recipe, if you will, for knowledge was JTB, okay? That is that one had to have a justified, true belief in order to have knowledge, okay? And this does go back to Plato, by the way, okay, this idea. Uh, but the rationalists held that the way you get justification is through reasoning. Empiricists, this other camp, held that the way you get justification is through observation with the senses, okay? Uh, we saw that with the British empiricists, for example. That, will, that view will go on to form the kind of the base uh, belief system or the base epistemology for modern science, okay? So the rationalists, this would be uh, Descartes, Spinoza, and Leibniz in the modern period, theorized that knowledge must arise, arise from our innate rational abilities. So before experience, it's a priori, this is what gives us certainty. And Descartes found that, for example, or he thought he had found it at least, when he discovers the cogito, okay? The empiricist, that would be uh, Bacon, Locke, Berkeley, and Hume, the British empirical tradition, theorized that justification can only come through the five senses. And it's after experience. It's, it's based on experience itself. It's a posteriori. And all this can do is give you probable knowledge. It can't give you certainty like the rationalists. And so these two schools went along parallel with each other, interacting somewhat, but they went along parallel with each other until it kind of came to a point where it could go no further. As we saw, Hume led the empiricists to skepticism, and one of the rationalists uh, of the Leibnizian tradition emerged to try to come to a solution with this, and this was Immanuel Kant. Okay, I'm, I'm having to give you a little background synopsis of epistemology here to get to Nietzsche. Uh, Kant will blend those two theories, the empiricism and the, the rationalism, uh, those two views of justification, and make both of them necessary. Senses give you information, but the rational mind orders and structures it in a distinctly human way. Okay, this is the Kantian view. Uh, but alas, for, for uh, Kantians, knowledge is not really certain, okay? Certainty is lost. Uh, Kant arose from his dogmatic slumber, awakened by Hume in his radical skepticism, and Kant's solution only softened the effects of skepticism, but didn't really uh, eliminate it. The effects still remain. So in Kant, because humans impose a kind of rid, rigid grid of concepts that are in, wired in our mind, upon everything that we sense, knowledge of the actual world as it is still remains beyond our grasp. Nietzsche understood all of this. Nietzsche lives in a post-Kantian age. He's a mid-19th century thinker. Kant died 1804. Kant's ideas had already become so widely accepted by uh, Nietzsche's day that, uh, uh, you know, that, and, and widely, widely believed by many philosophers such as, such, such as Schopenhauer. Uh, that Nietzsche is going to assume some of the Kantian views. But he understands this whole epistemological struggle, and he's going to answer this epistemological conundrum, if you will, in a wildly different way, and he's going to pioneer a new epistemological outlook that we would call perspectivism today. In fact, he's going to give it that name itself. So what is perspectivism? This is a type of relativism of knowledge. Nietzsche's perspectivism demotes knowledge. Uh, the rationalists, the empiricists, and Kant all positioned epistemology as the center of philosophy and everything. See, before Descartes, in the pre-modern period, the main thing driving philosophy was metaphysics. But beginning with Descartes and these empiricists that we've looked at, these two schools, they put epistemology front and center, or if you will, that becomes the hub of the wheel. That's the main thing, okay? And 
metaphysics, well, that's kind of out here. That's not as important. It's peripheral, okay? And ethics and so forth and so on, all of these were somewhat peripheral to the main question of how do you know what you know, epistemology. But now Nietzsche is going to move in a new direction. He is going to push, push epistemology out to the rim as well and say epistemology is peripheral, okay? And he's going to completely shove metaphysics off of the wheel altogether. Not only is metaphysics peripheral, it just doesn't exist, okay? And so, uh, what is at the center of this hub for Nietzsche? What does he put at the middle of the hub? And this is a novel move in the history of ideas. He's going to put the will there, okay? So, the will is what drives knowledge. So will precedes, drives, and rules over knowledge. It rules over truth, values, and even science itself. So Kant claimed, uh, for example, a Copernican revolution in epistemology where the world, uh, we, we've talked about you know, the Copernican revolution where the, you know, the world uh, revolves around the sun of human structures, okay? So that was Kant's uh, uh, epistemological revolution. So, uh, in Kant, you're the center, okay? Uh, and so the world has to conform to you. But Nietzsche is going to take this further. He's going to kind of have his own Copernican revolution, and he's going to say that not only does the world revolve around you, it revolves around the will, okay? And so it's not hard to see why his principle of will to power will become such a potent and even dangerous idea. Let's look at one of his tweets here. What then is truth? Truths are illusions about which one has forgotten that that's what they are. The idea being here that we create truths. Truths don't just exist, we make truths, okay? And so what's true from your perspective that you willed is not true from my perspective that I have willed. Can you imagine a shape, for example, uh, and perspectivism is usually illustrated like this visually. You can imagine a shape that from one angle it looks like a square. And if you walk around to another angle, it kind of looks like a triangle. Uh, but if you look down from on the top, it looks like a circle. And there are such shapes like that, okay? Or like an eclipse. Uh, from one perspective, you can see the total eclipse. But very few people can see that total eclipse. From another perspective, there's not even an eclipse at all if you're outside the zone where the eclipse falls. So, what the way you see the world on perspectivism depends upon your own unique subjective perspective. Okay, this is going to lead to an epistemological relativism that we will see later. So, for Nietzsche, our so-called knowledge is merely a kind of survival technique. It's not a genuine quest for the truth. We're not wired to find truth. We're wired to survive. Okay, now he's, he is a Darwinian here. Uh, he does accept Darwin's ideas, even though he doesn't fully accept the Darwinian thesis and so forth, you know, everything about Darwin. But he does believe that we have evolved. As, as, we, as we saw, you know, Darwin's ideas were not completely unique. He just gave us the final key for seeing the mechanism. But Nietzsche does basically accept this idea, and we're going to see it over and over in his thought. But survival trumps truth. Moreover, the brute facts of the world, whatever the brute facts are, we can't really obtain those brute facts. So we construe those facts however we want, however is, however is convenient for us, either as an individual or as the group that we're a part of, okay? So we construe the facts the way we want for our own survival, for our own benefit. So this is kind of a hyper-nominalist view also of reality and language, and it transforms all truth claims into illusions. So he says, for example, with one word sign, leaf, leaf is a word sign, if you will, a semiotic word sign. With that one word sign, we equalize billions of individual things that are not equal at all. And yet, after long use of the word sign, leaf, we deceive ourselves into thinking that the name itself is something that's real and it's universal. In other words, we reify it. We give that abstract a concrete reality and think that it's real. So this is kind of a nominalism taken further on down the, on the road here, but it's a materialistic nominalism. Now, you've probably heard of the illustration of, 
you know, five or six blind men who come up upon an object and they're fumbling around and they're feeling of the object. And one says, oh, it's a tree. And the other one says, no, it's a snake. And the other one feels and says, no, it's, this is a spear. And the other one feeling another part of it says, oh, it's a fan. And another one says, no, it's a wall. Okay. When they're all feeling the same object, they just have a different perspective on it. It's an elephant that they're that they have discovered, but they're just it's so big, they're feeling different parts, and it seems like something different to each one of them. Okay, And so he says uh, that there's only a perspectival seeing, only a perspectival knowing. Okay, So this is perspectivism. And it even extends to science. He says the sciences too rest on a faith because the necessary assumptions are not scientific. In other words, science rests upon or builds upon assumptions that don't come from science. The facts themselves don't really exist, only interpretations of observed phenomena.